hello, hello, hello. I hope you guys enjoy this twofer. Chapter 15 Aranimus Again Oh no, Ariel thought. Aranimus! The alien pirate's cold visage regarded them. His face was vaguely human, but had definite overtones of lizard. The eyes, for instance, were widely set, almost on the sides of his face. They were barely close enough together to give him binocular vision, but unnervingly, Aranimus didn't bother much of binocular vision. Most of the time, one eye focused on whatever she was looking at, while the other roved, apparently supplying peripheral vision. At the moment, he was focusing on Derek with both eyes. "'Derek,' he said, high-pitched, trilling. His voice was the most hateful thing Ariel had ever heard. "'Ariel!' Glaring at them, he altered the focus of his calm and shrank to distance without moving, his humanoid figure coming into view from the waist up. In this view, much of his alienness wasn't obvious, but they both had seen him in person. He was as tall seated as Derek was standing, and his disproportionately long arms had three times the span of a tall human's. Thin body, thin neck, domed, thinly haired head, pale skin, dark eyes, angry now. Where is the key to Perry Hellion? You escaped with it instead of leading me to robots. After a heart stopping moment, Derek glupped, temporarily shocked out of his sickness. Ariel said, with only a faint tremor in her voice, We we lost it in the wreck. We we've been in hospital on Earth. You lie. I detect three bursts of key static about this planet. The first weeks ago began elsewhere. The last two began and ended here. Only the key broadcast in this manner. They looked at each other, sickly. Before they could speak, the pirate pulled a small, gleaming gold pencil out of a pocket. Ariel choked, and she heard a glup from Derek, too. A pain stimulator. It was, she knew, something like a human neuronic whip but even more intense. Or perhaps Aranimus was just more violent with its use. It did no damage if not overused, like a neuronic whip, but no one was tough enough to take more than one treatment before deciding to cooperate. You will tell all and tell true, or I will kill you slow with this. They did not doubt his sincerity, nor would he listen to anything until he had taken the ship apart. They couldn't just give him the key, even if it could have been of use to him. It was initialized only for humans. He wanted robots, among other things, power most of all. Derek reached over and cut the channel. We have another option, he turned to her. We could use the key, call H. and Donovan, and put the whole problem in the laps of the TBI and whatever space authorities are on Earth. Or we can try to deal with Aranimus ourselves. Deal with him how? she said skeptically. I don't mean bargain, Ariel. You should use the key. His plans were clearly hardening as he spoke. I think I can ram that clumsy ship when he closes with us. Ariel felt herself pale. No, Derek. It's the only way. We can't let him live. He's too dangerous. But... Her face cleared. We can use the key at the last instant. Derek looked at her. The burst of adrenaline that had washed away his illness was fading. She determined that she would not use the key unless he did and he seemed to realize that. Okay, that's what we'll do. We'll pretend to surrender. He reached for the comm, but she grabbed his wrist. No, Derek, it won't work. He'll never leave this ship maneuverable while he closes. It's the only chance we got, he said. Our only weapon is the jet, in the nose of the ship. I'd like to fire the rocket at him, but he'd never pass in front of it. Ariel sighed, but she couldn't think of anything better. Okay, go get the key. I'll fly the ship. Derek nodded in relief, clearly not up to it. When they turned back to the comm channel, Aranimus was howling in his non-human voice, so shrilly as to make her teeth ache. You will not break communications again, humans! You! Very well. We have conferred and agreed to accede to your demands, she said. We ask only that you guarantee your lives, or we'll destroy the key in front of your eyes. You will not destroy the key, I will kill slow! Not if we're dead first said Derek, sounding tired and exasperated, the sound of a father dealing with wrangling children. We want your promise. 
The alien fell silent and studied them for a cold-blooded moment. Very well. You have my promise. I will not kill you if you give me the key, undamaged. Ariel had a moment in which he wondered if the alien might keep that promise. But it didn't matter. Derek was right. He had to die. She felt a momentary pang for the harmless and spiritless Narwi slaves with whom Aranimus manned his ship. Derek pulled the key out of his shirt and showed it to him. While Aranimus stared greedily at it, Ariel, at the controls, asked casually, Shall we maneuver to match you? No, I maneuver. There was a tense few minutes while the alien turned from them to his controls, rolled his ship, waited, 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 then burned toward them. At the end of the burn, the ship was not far away and still passing slowly. Again it rolled, now plainly visible, a vast ungainly mass of half a dozen or more holes stuck together. How Aranimus balanced that thing along a center of mass so he could fire rockets without spinning out of control, all without computer aid. Ariel couldn't imagine. He's too close, she thought panicky. They hadn't had time to get much velocity for the impact, or to set the key. Even as she thought, she glanced at Derek, who started squeezing the corners of the key. She slammed the rocket on, spinning the ship on its secondaries. The gyro, more economical of fuel, was much too slow. Arendimus might be a clumsy conglomerate, but he was a skilled pilot, and it was a battle wagon. It had adequate sensors even aft where the rockets were. The pirates spotted their maneuver and blasted aside, not bothering to scream at them over the comm channel. Ariel looked over at Derek and slammed into her seat by the acceleration. The key was ready, but they weren't. The alien ship was above them, then beside them, even as she struggled to turn nose on toward it. Too late, Aranimus had slid aside. Ariel instantly cut the jet and started to spin ship, not to get too far away. Aranimus's gunners would have them in their sights the instant they cleared the near zone. Aranimus shrewdly slapped on more side thrust when he saw which way she was turning, in order to widen the gap between them. Then the collision alarm rang. They heard Aranimus yelling for the first time since the battle began. Ariel fought them onto a line with the alien ship, too busy to look about. The rock is moving, Derek cried. The chunk of rock that had swung in behind them and had gradually been overtaking them was now accelerating toward them at about a standard gravity, and the bowler registered the temperature of rocket exhaust. Woolruth's face appeared beside the diminished figure of Aranimus on their board. Hold him, Derek! I come! What Aranimus said was not intelligible, but energy lanced from the big ship at the rock. The rock vaporized, its outline flashing away in puffs of incandescent vapor as the guns bore. Those same mighty weapons had vaporized cubic meters of ices and snow at near absolute zero on the ice asteroid where Aranimus had first found Derek. Underneath the flimsy camouflage was a little star seeker like their own. Ariel's vision dimmed as she cut in the rocket's full power. In a moment she cut them off. Her head bobbed against the headrest, and the ship was again diving toward Aranimus. He rolled and blasted to avoid them, and something monstrous slapped their flank, making the ship ring. Puncture! Derek gasped, but she had no time. She had to hold him till Woolruff got there. Aranimus rolled his big ship again, and again blasted to avoid her, throwing off his gunner's aim. Good job. He doesn't have computerized fire control, Ariel thought. She was confronted with a split-second tactical problem. In moments, they'd be past the alien ship, too soon to roll nose-on toward it. Aranimus had seen their intent and was going the other way, so she rotated further in the direction the nose pointed, to bring their tail toward the enemy. At the crucial moment, she blasted, and fire splashed over Aranimus's ship. It must have rung like a bell. There was a great outrush of air and assorted particles. Ariel was grateful she couldn't see well enough to tell if the particles were kicking. In a flashing moment they were past, and the reflected flame glare died, and Aranimus was moving again, fire spurting from points on the ungainly hulls. Another kind of fire flashed, their own ship gonged when hit, jolted again as Ariel's head rattled against the headrest and alarms yelled. 
Derek was saying something as she spun the ship as rapidly as shaking hands would let her. Mistake, she thought. She'd never have blasted away from him. Now they were far enough for the gunners to sight them. Clenching her teeth, Ariel rolled the ship again, trying to ignore the hits, hoping one wouldn't disable them or kill them. A strangled stray bolt would. We're still in their near zone, said Derek breathlessly, glancing hits only. True, she thought, smiling mirthlessly. They were still alive. And then they had completed their role, much farther from Aranimus than she'd like, and she blasted back. No more hits. The uneven outline of the alien ship grew and grew in their vision screens, and she breathed more evenly. Then she had a moment of wonder. She felt better because she was not going to be killed by Aranimus's gunners in the next few moments. But she was trying to commit suicide by ramming his ship. Aranimus began to slide aside, and she automatically corrected, centering on the dark bulk. What should we do? Bullruff is closing fast, but I don't know if she's still maneuverable, said Derek tensely. She got hit hard. Give her a call? Then Aranimus' ship loomed monstrous, and the alien had arranged a surprise. A gun on the hull swung to bear on them. What prodigies of effort had gone to ready it in the short time the battle had taken, they would never know. It was a full-sized gun, though its first bolt was weak, an aiming shot. Aranimus's gunners were not the timid Narwi. They were starfish-shaped creatures about whom Ariel knew little. They avoided the light and breathed a slightly different atmosphere than the rest of the crew. She felt no compunction about them, and spun the ship aside. Aranimus saw that and moved to prevent her from pointing her rockets at the new gun. A second bolt flashed at them, but the gunners lacked Aranimus' own savage efficiency. "'Another puncture or antenna's out,' said Derek calmly. His calmness calmed her, and she made one more attempt to ram. In turning away her jet, Aranimus had run before their nose. She had cracked on full power, and they were hurled back into their seats. Her vision dimmed. She thought it was the power fading. Too slow, the huge, blotted body of the enemy slid sideways, even as it grew monstrous before them. Then the vision screen erupted in one pale flare, pale because the safety circuit wouldn't transmit the whole visual part of the flash. The sensor had taken the next hit from the gun. "'There went her bow!' Derek cried. Ariel glupped, half expecting to see space before her, but they hadn't lost that much of the bow. With vision out, she could only crouch— panting at her board, the rocket off, hoping for— "'The key! Trigger it!' she cried, turning to him. Knowing in a flashing moment that it was too late, they'd hit. The ship jolted, and the impact was quite different from the gun hits. They were thrown forward against their straps. The ships shuddered. Metal squealed. Something broke all in an instant. Then they were free, the ship floating quietly. Air hissed out, alarms still burning and shrilling. All communications out, no exterior view. Ariel touched her controls, and the attitude jets responded. She could turn and burn again, but they were blind. "'Suits,' said Derek, "'and see if the other circuit can give us more eyes.' "'Suits first, she thought. "'When the air goes out of a small ship, can go fast. "'Should have had them on all along, if they'd had time.' "'They scrambled into their suits in a free-fall comedy that was deadly serious. "'Every moment Ariel expected the lancing fire of a hit.' but the ship continued serenely on its way. They didn't bother to try communications, knowing that the gun's bolt or the impact must have destroyed the forward antennas. Vision, however, could only be brought in from any quarter of the ship. Only the bow eyes were out. After a bit of fumbling, they found an undamaged sensor that bore toward their late battle. What, what is it? Ariel asked, awed. I was about to ask you, Derek said. You know more about Aranimus' ship you're on it longer. That was before my amnesia, she said. Oh. I think one of the hulls broken free? They only had a partial view of it. It was below the sensor's view. Only a spinning, irregular curve of dark metal, with an occasional highlight gleaming here and there. A projection. Derek's turrets, landing port sensors, and interior beams? It can't be the whole ship, Derek said finally. But what happened to it? Ariel took a deep breath, found the air inside her suit, rank with her sweat. I'll turn around, she said, chagrined. I didn't realize how tense I was. 
She wasn't thinking I'll never be a combat pilot, she thought shakily. Wasted minutes looking into a view I could have adjusted. The pilots get used to this kind of thing. But the human race had no combat pilots. No telling how well they could perform. Grimly, she thought, if there are many of Aranimus's kind in space, we may have to learn. Aranimus, he's disintegrated, Derek said. The big composite ship was now a dozen big pieces in a cloud of hundreds of smaller ones. They looked at each other. Derek's face was as blank as she felt her own to be. Did we do that? She asked. I don't see how. Woolruff! After a moment, she nodded. You must be right. But where did she get the guns? Derek just shook his head. If anybody was alive over there, they weren't disposed to do any more shooting. The wreckage was retreating slowly. Ariel came to herself with a start. We've got to go back over there. Frost, yes. But how? It wasn't easy, but they worked it out. The view they had gave them bearings. They chose a spot that would enable them to miss any of the junk, and rotated the ship until its blind nose pointed along that bearing. Ariel then placed her hands on the board, looking into the darkness, and thought, Now we find out how good a pilot you are, girl. In a moment she was back on Aurora, about to do her first solo takeoff. She'd had that very thought, or something very close to it, and even more nervousness than now. Now, though, she was in shock. The memories went on and on, the takeoff, the acceleration, seeming more fierce than ever now, that she had to remain conscious. The relief as the jet shut down, and then the indescribable free-floating sensation of one's first solo orbit. Ariel? Her instructor. Ariel? With a shake, she brought herself out of it. Sorry, memory fugue. As her hands moved over the board, taking care to push the buttons on the real board instead of the remembered one, the memories went on, flashed back, picked up details. A whole chunk of her past restored to her by chance, thought, a chance repetition of forgotten circumstance. She burned for ten seconds and rolled the ship to steady the junk. There should be detectors back there that would tell them how fast they were moving relative to the junk, but they weren't working. The junk still seemed to be receding. Ariel rolled and blasted for another twenty seconds, again looked. That should do it. They had only to wait, floating toward the wrecked ship, aft end first, ready to burn the breakdown. How did she do it? Thus ends this chapter, but don't despair, there will be another one in about half an hour. Uh not quite sure which she is being referenced in that last line, but I guess maybe we're about to find out. Alright, bye!